Good afternoon, everyone. This is Hannah, your moderator for today's discussion. Welcome to DG Talks. Uh, DG Talks because this is about uh, this discussion is about disability, gender, and the intersection of both. So again, my name is Hannah, and um, uh, before we start the program, I would like to. Good afternoon. I would like to read the accessibility guidelines for those who weren't able to uh, read this earlier. So our moderators and facilitators are women with visual impairments. We also have participants who are deaf. To ensure that we will help make our learning space inclusive, please follow these guidelines. First, use person-first and inclusive language. For example, person who is blind, person with visual impairment, person with low vision. For the deaf, for example, deaf, uh, persons who are deaf or hard of hearing. Next, when you introduce yourself for the first time, give a verbal description of yourself. For example, hello everyone, I am Jen uh, from the ASEAN Soji Caucus. I have long black hair and I am wearing glasses. Next, whenever you unmute your mic to express your thoughts or ask questions, always introduce yourself and the organization you're from. Next, whenever you refer to visual content, such as images or tables, charts or videos, always provide visual descriptions example i am sharing a slide depicting a scene in the park next when referring to anything shared on the screen avoid using demonstrative words such as this that these or those instead specify the position by using words like left right top bottom Next, be mindful of your pacing while sharing so that the interpreters do not have difficulty captioning or catching up. No need to slow down, but make sure to talk steadily. So I would like to call in Jen for the opening remarks. Thanks, Hannah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to our friends here in the Philippines, as well as our international guests from Malaysia, Cambodia, and Japan, I think. So I am Jen. I'm the program officer of Forging Intersectional Feminist Futures, um, which is a project under ASEAN Soji Kokos, as well as other regional organization. Um, I guess I would like to give more context to everyone, especially those who who's interacting with this project for the first time. Um, Forging Intersectional Feminist Futures is a regional collaboration aimed at strengthening the intersectional movement building in Asia. And the reason why ASC is involved in this project is because we believe in intersectionality. In fact, in it's part of our organizational principles and part of that is a strategic priority to mainstream SOGI SC within ASEAN civil society, which in itself is already intersectional. And that is why we have this partnership with Novel and TerpCap to bring to everyone um, 
the advocacy on disability justice and disability inclusion, especially since, but not just because, especially since it's uh, Disability Pride Month this month. So happy Disability Pride Month to everyone. But I won't keep this long because I, I'm merely supporting novel and I really want them to to shine and take space in our learning session this afternoon. Once again, thank you everyone for being part of our learning session and I'm sure that you will learn a lot today. Thank you, I'll pass this back to you, Hannah. Thanks, Jen. So before we start with the uh, presentation, uh, uh, presentations, I would also like to uh, orient everyone about the terms that we use. I'm here on the slide. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Jen. So uh, the correct term is uh, to refer to persons with disabilities is persons with disabilities, uh, not PWD or a uh, handicap or any other term that we used to use. I know all of us have been guilty about this. So for the uh, Tagalog word, taong may kapansanan, for um, women with disabilities, women with disabilities, not WWD or disabled women. So like I said earlier, we use uh, person first language. So in Tagalog, kababaihang may kapansanan. For the children, child with disabilities, batang may kapansanan in Tagalog. So for people without disabilities, persons without disabilities, or in Tagalog, taong walang kapansanan. So the terms that we don't use anymore or that we shouldn't use are handicapped, physically or mentally challenged, able, sufferer, stricken, wheelchair bound, etc. So next, uh, we will have a Q&A or question and answer session later, uh, but then uh, we have to, um, Jen will collate the questions, so let's just, um, let's just type them and um, Jen will collate them for later. Uh, before the sessions, uh, presentations end. So I would like to introduce Novel, or the Nationwide Organization for Visually Impaired Empowered Ladies. Give me just a second. Sorry, I'm having I'm having technical problems. I can't access the notes. Jen, can you please read? Sure. Hold on. Sorry. No worries. All right. So, Anna, you were in the middle of introducing novel. Is that right? Okay. Um. So, novel is the nationwide organization of visually impaired empowered ladies it's an organization of women with visual impairment and uh, specifically women who are blind and women with low vision it started in october 2012 but was officially registered in 2013. the group felt that women with visual impairment should be more visible 
participating and leading within and outside the disability and gender movements. Focused on gender equality, disability, inclusion, and intersectionality. Some of the prominent activities of the group include training on disability and gender-related rights, convention on the rights of persons with disabilities, intersectionality, and disability inclusive development, or DID, to the government, CSOs, and NGOs as well as persons with disabilities, including women and children as individuals. They've also contributed on parallel and um, shadowed together with reports with other organizations and civil society organizations submitted to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and CEDO committees. They've also conducted and managed research projects such as budget analysis on the government spending for persons with disabilities using CRPD as a lens. They've also done module reviews and development on gender equality and disability inclusion and have raised awareness about women with visual impairment and the white cane through social media and Philippine Fashion Week. Um, where two models who are blind took the runway with their white canes to promote inclusion and independent living of women with visual impairment in society. They are also the coordinator during the community-based peer monitoring on the situation of women with disabilities amidst COVID pandemic, funded by UNFPA Philippines, UNFPA Philippines with CHR Gender Equality and Women's Rights Center and other organizations of women with disabilities nationwide. They are also a trainer and participants in various local and international meetings, shops, and conferences. And they have, not just have, they continue to lead in advocating the Disability Support Allowance Bill to the 18th and 19th Congress. Uh, Hannah, let me know if you can jump in or if you want me to continue reading. Thanks, Jen. Sorry. Um, next, we will introduce our first speaker for this afternoon. Uh, but of course, I cannot <laughs> read the notes right now. So, Jen, sorry. Sure. Please. No Thank problem. you. This next speaker is a woman with low vision and impairment was due to open angle glaucoma. She is the secretary of novel and an alumnus of Disability, Sexuality and Rights Online Institute or DSROI. She's also part of the training and module review and development teams of various projects of Save the Children Philippines and is a consultant on the community-based inclusive development initiative of CBM International, an INGO based in Germany. She's also a member of Inclusive Generation Equality Collective, a global group of feminists with disabilities and advocates of disability and gender related rights. She's the lead of the technical working group advocating for the Disability Support Allowance Bill and on a personal note, she is an ambivert and a certified Ravenclaw and Potterhead. Um, folks, I would like to introduce to you Sheila May Agarau, and her pronouns are she and her. Yes, thank you so much, Jen, and uh, thank you so much, Hannah, um, for moderating this uh, session and yeah, for introducing novel as well and me. Um, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Magandang hapon po sa inyo. <laughs> and uh, bear with me as we go on in this uh, session. Bear with my English. Uh, I need many tissue. Uh, I hope will uh, my nose will not bleed. I'll try my best. So thank you, everyone, for being with us in this uh, session, learning session on disability and gender and its intersectionality. And um, 
we're really great to be part of uh, this project and to be partners with you uh, towards um, an intersectional feminist future. So uh, again, let me introduce myself. I'm Sheila. I'm a woman with low vision. Uh, my description is I'm a, a woman with a chubby face. I have long hair, brownish long hair, and I'm currently wearing a white top with uh, underneath a blue spaghetti dress and uh, I'm wear I'm have I have a headphone yeah so let's begin this uh, session so before we dive in into disability and gender let us first look what is the situation of uh, persons with disabilities globally and uh, uh, in a national level so next slide please so I'll be reading some data about persons with disabilities. So the first one is according to the World Health Organization report on disability, uh, this is 2011, so quite old, but uh, still very le relevant. 15% of um, the world's population is living with some form of disability. So if we have like around 7 billion people uh, in the world, 15% of it, what's our math? <laughs> Let's see. Okay, around 1 billion people have disability and this uh, not include their families and their associates. So, so they say the persons with disabilities are the largest like minority in the world, they say. And uh, the second um, data is that 75% of people uh, with disabilities living in middle and low income countries, uh, like for example, the Philippines are women. So why is it like that? So it says something. Why is it that like three fourths of uh, persons with disabilities that are relatively like poor are women? So later on, we'll know more about that. And then and the next, uh, the next uh, data is that According to the Listahanan 2019, so Listahanan is a national uh, targeting and housing survey or system um, by the Department of Social Welfare and Development, which um, surveys or gathers data about, uh, about who are the are people living in poverty in a country for like the Philippines. So according to this uh, list or report, there are that 60% of children with disabilities are out of school. So uh, really, and um, according to a study by UNICEF, it's around, um, there are around like 5 million children with disabilities. So 60% of that, around 3 million of children with disabilities are out of school. And then the next data that I'm, I'll be showing to you is that uh, the National Disability and Prevalence Survey in 2016 conducted by the Philippine Statistics Authority. And it says here that 50% uh, 50, uh, 50 or 51% um, uh, of Filipinos with disabilities are not working or unemployed. So this is really re relative to the, to the number of children without with disabilities who are not studying because you know if you don't have you don't get the quality the proper education that you need then there's uh you know a big chance that you won't be able to get a, a, a gainful employment a decent employment so more people with disabilities who are not studying then less people who will get decent jobs uh, and employment and lastly Persons with disabilities are more four times to be to be victim of um, or to be a trace of violence and abuse. So later on, we'll know more of that. Why is it that persons with disabilities have higher risk of being violated and being abused? So that's the statistics for persons with disabilities. Next slide, please. And so how do we change this, these figures? We, the figures that I showed to you were kind of like um, um, sad figures about persons with disabilities. So how do we change the narrative? How do we improve or um, 
reduce you know the, the figures on violence and those who are not employed yeah so it's really important that we understand first what is disability so in this slide i'm showing there's a picture of uh, two people one is in a wheelchair and one is standing uh, she has a prosthesis and they are high fiving so next slide please so we'll have a short activity I would like to ask you a question. What for you, what is this ability? So um, Jen is sharing a link on men, uh, Mentimeter and kindly answer, uh, go into that link and kindly answer the question. Well, for you, what is this ability? So the link is in the chat box. Yeah, but in case you cannot, uh, you cannot access the link, you may type in. Yeah, you may type in in the chat box or say, uh, raise your hand and speak out your answer. It seems that everyone is quiet. <laughs> Shesta time. <laughs> uh, they say "ora de ano de peligro." <laughs> so I hope everyone has they have their coffee with them and awake at this moment <laughs> Ayan. so jen will share to us uh, jen matter no uh, are there people already answering yes hi sheila so far yeah. we have around yes there are people answering and i can read them now yes thank you so far, words that are included here are condition, access difficulty, senses impairment, barrier, different, marginalized, physical challenges, mental limitations. Um, there's no like one big word yet. They're all mm -hmm. very different answers. Yep. Okay. So let's have another 30 seconds for the answers of our participants. Yeah, keep them coming. Yeah, if you cannot type into the menti, you may type in the chat box. Okay, I'll just continue reading some of them. Yep. Vulnerable, aggression, non-physical, uh, below the normal, challenge from doing task, pain, minority I'm just checking if I've read it painful mm -hmm. I still don't see like one big word <laughs> yeah it's okay functionality mm -hmm. yep yes and I think there's one answer okay. in the chat box yes actually now there's one highlight in Mentimeter and it's impairment Okay. Um, Alona in the chat box said, disability refers to people who are often forgotten um, in their deed and work. Yep. Thank you, Alona. And um, yeah, so in case uh, you need, uh, there are participants here who may may need uh, assistance in terms of translation. Yes, uh, give give us a heads up. Yeah. And, and I think and there's another one, yes. Jen. From Lizelle of Intersex Philippines. She said, disability is a physical or mental condition that limits a person's movement, senses, or activities. Okay. And then just okay. going back to Menti, I see words that are highlighted, barrier, and discriminated. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So yeah, we'll end the, the Mentimeter. And thank you everyone for your participation and your um, insights about what disability is. So let's see, what really disability, what is disability? Okay, 
So in this slide, you will see, well, I've uh, noticed a lot of you answer that disability is impairment. Some, some other people talk about barriers, discrimination, marginalization. Some said that we are not being heard. So somewhat we are like the minority because like we, our voices are not heard or um, some people talk about pain, some people talk about challenges, physical or mental challenges, functionality, and um, sorry, I cannot remember everything, but a lot of you talk about a lot of things and different perspectives about disability. So in a um, very simple, uh, very, in very simple ex explanation is that impairment is not equal to disability. So when we talk about the impairment, it's really about, yeah, it uh, talks about the functional uh, limitations of a person, the condition, the physical or mental condition. For example, a person cannot walk or the person has uh, no limb, uh, uh, the person is am an amputee or the person has sensorial impairment. Like for example, for me, I am a woman with low vision. Um, for example, a person, a deaf person, a person with hard of hearing, or a person who is uh, deaf and also blind. So there are multiple, multiple impairments. And there are also people with intellectual impairment, like, for example, persons with Down syndrome. There are people under the autism spectrum, and there are people with psychosocial impairment, like those who have bipolarism, those who are uh, have uh, manic depression. So those are the impairment, the functional limitation, the physical mental condition of a person. When, to summarize what disability is, let's look into the formula. Impairment plus barriers, you mentioned barriers equals disability. So when a person with impairment encounters a barrier and that interacts, it results to disability. So a person with impairment is not necessarily uh, a person with disabilities. If the person encounters a barrier, that uh, disables that person, not the impairment. Okay, we'll explain more about that on the next slide. On the succeeding slides, I mean. Thank you. So the next uh, slide that we have is a uh, the four popular approaches to disability. Over time, there have been a different uh, view about disability approaches and the four the most popular ones are the charity medical social and rights-based uh, approach and um, the rights-based approach is the one aligned with the convention on the rights of persons with disabilities so what what is the convention on the rights of persons with disabilities and what are these approaches we'll find out okay next slide please Okay, so the first um, approach is the charity approach. So here, so you can see here a slide saying that uh, the people saying to persons with disabilities, poor people, that um, poor, poor people, we should help them if we want and we can. So there's a charity house. So in this approach, they see persons with a disability as like uh, an ob objects of charity, objects of donations, people who are helpless, who cannot take care of themselves, you know, dependent to their families, dependent to different institu institutions. And uh, yeah, they, and the mindset here of the, of people or uh, governments that a uh, practicing charity approach is, is, is that what we give to you is just out of our kind hearts, out of goodwill, our benevolence. It's There's no accountability. No? So here, I, I, know, I don't know if in the other countries, they, I, uh, how do you say it? But in the Philippines, you, you say it like, oh, you're so, don't be choosy. <laughs> Because we are just giving you, you know, you're doing this out of our goodwill. So you don't be, you need, don't need to be choosy. It doesn't matter if you get a wheelchair that, that does not fit you or you get the support or you, you, yeah, you should be grateful no matter what we give you. Like, for example, a deaf that was provided an, an, a sign language interpreter without asking the deaf if 
uh, that deaf person is comfort comfortable or um, prefers that interpreter. So that's like charity approach. And of course, um, it creates a culture of dependence also for persons with disabilities because they will just be like, like rely on donations and uh, you know, be submissive on what just people would think and um, say to them. So that's charity approach. So next slide, please. So here is the medical approach. Uh, but by the way, I just would like to say the charity, of course, is not a bad thing. But if you know, we revolve our 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 support just based on charity, and there's no accountability, and then there's you know that's the pro that's where the problem starts. So medical approach, uh, on the other hand. Um, in the slide, it says here that um, poor people, we should fix them so they can participate. And I would like to differentiate the medical approach from the medical intervention and, of course, healthcare. All of us needs quality healthcare. It's a right, of course. And But here in the medical approach, it says here that um, persons with disabilities should be fixed, should be cured before they will be... Uh, included in the society before they can go to school, study, uh, be employed, or like um, uh, get married, have a family, and participate in community life. So a, a person who cannot walk needs to walk first. A person who cannot see needs, needs to see again. A, a deaf person needs to hear again before they can like participate. And well, rehabilitation is like an important part of a person with disabilities life, like speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy. But if we rely everything on rehabilitation, like it's if you cannot be rehabilitated, that's your, that's the end of the world for you, then that's the problem. And also in medical approach, like if the uh, the doctor or the medical professional is, you know, deciding for the person not uh, giving uh, not um, giving them options or not uh, um, allowing them to exercise their their will and preferences their freedom of choice then uh, that's uh, that's the problem so next slide please so what are the consequences of medical and uh, charity approach so ob object of uh, benevolence instead of duty and rights stigmatization persons with disabilities are being you know continue to experience uh, discrimination and negative attitudes um, from from people even from their families so submission disempowerment persons with disabilities will just be like say yes to everything without asserting their rights without deciding for themselves and yeah Force institu institutionalization. This happens to especially for persons with psychosocial impairment and for those older persons with disabilities. They are put into homes and they are being segregated, separated from the community. So um, it's a violation of human rights of these people. And especially if it's like out of their out of their choice or like informed consent. And dependence. So people, people with disabilities can uh, just depend on their families and if, you know, to manage their lives. And uh, there's image disparagement. Next slide, please. Okay. So the social approach, we look here, you know, see, uh, that um, remember the formula I showed to you a while back, impairment plus barriers equals disability. So in the social model, we say that, oh, um, it's not the person with impairment. It's not the, the impairment is not the problem, but there are barriers in the uh, community, barriers and biases that prevents the person with disability from equally and fully participating in the community. So you look at the environment, not the person. And so... So in this, in this um, social model, we see that we should eliminate the barriers and facilitate the access and inclusion of persons with disabilities. Next slide, please. 
So the next one is the rights-based approach. So this is like um, from the social mod, adopting the social model, but this is like a level level up thing, you no? Know? Because this in this in this uh, approach, it says that you know it's not enough that barriers are eliminated there is access but here there's a recognition that persons with disabilities have equal rights like any other people or like any other group in the society and because of that we should be participating in uh, in both in our family and community life that uh, we can that we should decide for ourselves and like um there should be there should be no discrimination on the basis of disability. Yeah. So, um, and of course, um, convention uh, the the rights based approach is uh, reflected or uh, um, embodied in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So, next slide, please. CRPD. So it's like an international uh, agreement between uh, uh, states, between governments that they will promote, protect, and fulfill the rights of persons with disabilities in order for us to fully and effectively participate in the community on an equal basis with other people. So I think uh, shared to Jen the link of yeah, the CRPD. So you can have a take a look at it, and you can refer to them. So um, the the CRPD, the the Philippines is a state party, meaning they signed and ratified the convention. So they are legally bound to implement the the provisions of a CRPD. So. Next slide, please. So, in a in a nutshell, um, there's a hundred eighty degree turn from the medical and charity model. So, there's a paradigm shift. So, from being objects of charity, we are now seen as subjects of rights, and we and we look at we look at persons with disabilities as people who are capable of claiming asserting those rights and we are people that can make decisions our with uh with our lives given the proper support the adequate support and of course um based on um we can make decisions without you know the fear of being intimidated or being uh being hurt by others and also we can be active members of the society like everybody else so there's a universal uh, there's a the convention uh, states that there's a univer uh, the, uh, recognition that we we also have that inherent dignity as they say from womb to tomb and your rights are our rights also next slide please so the next slide here may I request a volunteer to kindly read what's on the slide so I can hear your beautiful voices, no? <laughs> volunteer, you can volunteer. Hi, I can volunteer. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Gayatri. I'm from a women's aid organization from Malaysia. I have short curly hair and I'm wearing glasses. Yeah. Um, who are persons with disabilities? People with long-term impairment facing various barriers that hinder their full and effective participation in society. Yep. Thank you so much from our friend from Malaysia. And welcome. So uh, this is according to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So basically, it's like the, the formula I, I showed to you a while back. Impairment plus barrier equals disability. But of course, here, it has the word persons. So persons with long-term impairment that are experiencing or encountering various barriers. That's why their participation in the community are being you know, hindered or being restricted. So again, reminding everyone the use of person-first language, emphasizing on that because 
you know, we are all person first before our disability or before any identity that we have. I, disability is just one of our uh, identities, same as our gender, age, uh, race, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So here you'll see uh, impairment plus barriers equals disability and impairment plus access equals inclusion. So here in the screen, you have two different photos. So the left photo, you will see a person on wheelchair, using a wheelchair, and that person is going up the stairs uh, because he, he is going to take the train. However, because that, uh, the, the train station is not accessible, there's no elevator, I know you are also you, in the in especially here in Manila. I I know that you are very familiar of our train stations. Elevator is always out of order most of the time, and that's why there were there are security guards, and these security guards will carry the person in wheelchair going up to the train station. So what's the problem here? So the um. The, the train station is not accessible. Therefore, the person in wheelchair needs some other people in order to be there in the station to ride the train and go to the place where he wants to go. And uh, looking at it, um, what if the, the security guards are not there immediately what if it will take them 30 minutes or one hour before they can help the person so what what will happen to the person the person will just wait what if the person needs to go to the office or has a meeting or you know has an emergency to to go to you will say oh he uh, that person just uh, ride a taxi so that's an equal opportunity already. That person has to spend more just to go to the same place, whereas a person without disability just need to pay like uh, 20 pesos or a little less than $1 to go to the same place. Yeah? And let's, let's say here, oh, they will just carry the person. Yeah, that's good. Well, it's not good because carrying that person in that flight um, of stairs is not a dignified way of assisting a person with disability. Secondly, if they, uh, it's unsafe for them, one wrong move for the security guards and for the person on wheelchair, they could be injured and um, worse, they could be dead. So that's the barriers that this picture shows us. On the other hand, I have here a, a picture of a, um, a man uh, in a wheelchair, a person in a wheelchair um, going to an accessible nipahat or a kubo in Filipino. So look at it, even a kubo can be accessible if we just want to, be, make, to make it accessible. And that person is on a wheelchair because what's the use of a ramp if there's no wheelchair? And um, that person is um, uh, quadriplegic, so he is, uh, means he's from neck down, he's paralyzed, so he's being pushed by his personal assistant. So with that support service from his personal assistant, the assistive device, his wheelchair, and the accessible facility, the ramp, the person was able to access the house. Next slide, please. So for a while, please, I'm having a technical problem. Okay. Okay, so here in this picture, you will see uh, that the uh, person a symbol of persons with disabilities interacting with their society, with the community. So everything from workplace to hospital to schools to recreational areas, we all go there. So if there's a barrier, if in one of those places, then, you know, our right for that particular 
Act service is being violated. Next slide, please. Okay. So, barriers. So, um, may I ask again a volunteer to kindly read the slide? Okay, if we have no vol, no, yeah, someone open their mic. Sheila, this is Ryan. I can volunteer. Yes, Ryan. Hi, this is Ryan from Asin Soji Kokos. I'm wearing uh, glasses and a black shirt. So the text goes, barriers are anything that hinders persons with disabilities from enjoying or exercising all human rights and fundamental freedoms in the political, economic, social, cultural, civil, or any other field on an equal basis with others. Back to you. Thank you, Ryan. So again, barriers. These are the things or the attitude of people that uh, hinder, prevent, hinder persons with disabilities from participating on an equal basis with others in the society. So what are the different types of barriers? So let's see. Okay, so uh, in this in the screen, you will find different types of barriers like physical, information, and communication, um, institutional, as well as attitudinal. So to help us more understand it better, um, I'll put it on the context of education. So the first one is the physical barrier. So when, of course, when we think about education, the first thing that goes to our mind is the, the school, right? So um, if there are physical barriers, for example, um, the school grounds is not accessible for persons using a wheelchair, uh, the doorways of their classrooms are not wide enough for persons in on using wheelchair, the there are no hand railings that will guide or help uh, persons with visual impairment to walk around. There are no tactile flooring, for example. The toilets are not accessible um, wide enough and do not have hand railings for people who are in wheelchair. Then they cannot go to school. They will not be able to study. If the classroom's uh, second floor uh, does uh, and above or buildings do not have elevators and ramps how can the child with disability or learner with disability go to that to that room you may say oh just go down and uh, the classmates just go down but are all the rooms in the first floor or are what it feels like you know depriving the person of acts of, of aside from you know enjoying the view up there also so um socializing and you know um, experiencing what's you know the the second and upper floors and of course yeah the other rooms cannot be all all everything in the first floor and of course when we talk about physical barriers there is the transportation so yes the, the school facilities are accessible but what if the transportation is not accessible and we know that our jeeps our tricycles our public utility vehicles, they are not designed to be accessible to persons with disabilities, right? So those are the physical, the barriers in the, uh, in the physical space. Also the bridges, the foot bridges. Remember just a few weeks ago, uh, a diplomat um, criticized the, the very high foot bridge that we have in Quezon City. No, it's not accessible to persons with disabilities, to older persons, and even to people. No, it's really steep. And what's funny, you know, there are we have foot bridges in the Philippines that the one side has ramp, but the other side do not have. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's very funny. Fun, funny, but not, but not of course good. Um, the next barrier is the information and communication. When we talk about barriers, the often oftentimes it's like only it people only think of physical, but there are also barriers in information and communication. Again, let me uh, go to the context of education. So, for example, the the textbooks, 
the reading materials, the activity books, the test exam papers, everything, the learning materials. What if they are all in printed materials? How can a person who is blind, who is using a Braille, uh, can access it if it's not an, in, in different formats like audio, like large print for those with low vision. So how can we access that? How can we uh, take exam, a study? Huh? And also, um, what if the language is too technical and it's not simple, it's not plain, it doesn't have pictures? How can uh, learners with intellectual disabilities um, understand or have equal access to it. And of course, if in the classroom, there is like no sign language interpreters for deaf students, no closed captioning for hard of hearing, then how can we uh, communicate with our teachers, with our classmates, with, the, uh, with our um, other personnel in the school? So that's information and communication. So next is that the institutional barrier. So these are the barriers in policies and uh, practices. So if the country has a, has a law on special education, it means segregated education, then it's a violation. It's a barrier. It's discrimination uh, on learners with disabilities. And um, luckily, Fortunately, we all now we now have the inclusive education law for learners with disabilities here in the Philippines. So, and um, of course, if there is absence of law on inclusion and providing support for learners with disabilities, then it's also a barrier. So having discriminatory law and the absence of law, both are barriers. And of course, if you do not have budget for it, that's also an institutional barrier. And lastly is the attitudinal barrier. This is a barrier. These are the most uh, persisting barriers that we have. Negative attitude towards persons with disabilities, teachers who do not want to teach children with disabilities, um, students or learners that you know bully children with disabilities or do not include them in activities or um, even the patronizing attitude towards persons with disabilities that can be an attitudinal barrier so um, this is just in the context of education but uh, it has similarities and differences in terms of like for example when we talk about health employment um, uh, access to justice and so on and so forth. So next slide, please. Okay, so let's have a short activity. Um, I'll show you some pictures and let's identify, is there a barrier here? So the first, so you'll just uh, type in in the chat or raise your hand and tell me if there's a barrier here. So next slide, please. So a caricature of a person, there is like a visual, so visual like doorbell. So is there a barrier here? Someone said yes. Okay, do you agree? Is there a barrier here? If it's yes, what could be the barrier? What do you think? What can be the bar? What could be the barrier here in this picture? Uh, there is like the the and the one who answered yes in the chat. Uh, can you? Yes, uh, I I type. Uh, yeah, I'm Gayatri from Malaysia. I typed in yes. that um, if there's a person uh, a person who's blind or uh, hard of sight, they cannot see the light. Yep. Thank you so much. So I, so it's like coming from a perspective that if this person in the in the picture is a person with visual impairment, yeah, that's a good point. So if the the signal doesn't have a audio audio um, signal, then it would be difficult for that person. That would be that would be a barrier. But for persons who are deaf. No, some um, somewhat. This is like uh, 
it's not a barrier because it's like a visual alarm for them, like a visual doorbell. If you have watched the movie Isa Panga with Feelings, like with Carlo Aquino and Main Mendoza, Main made a, a visual uh, doorbell, like signal for Carlo Aquino so that he will see the that there are people outside the people outside the, the his door and this is also true during emergencies if there are no audio or visual signals or alarms how could the person who uh, is blind or deaf person be able to to be signaled that oh there's an emergency right so the early warning systems that we have in times of disaster so better to reflect if they are you know accessible to persons with disabilities next slide please okay so there's a caricature here a person in using a wheelchair uh, that person is outside and like there are steps going to to the house so do you think there's a barrier here Hi, Sheila. I see Disney making an X sign. Ah, hi, Disney. Okay. Um, will Disney speak or, or sign? or Yeah. So, Disney, can you tell us what is the barrier here? You said there's uh, okay, uh, yes. X. Hello? Yes. Hello. Okay, yeah. coming from Disney. Um, okay, yes, it's a barrier sign. Because um, we cannot enter. Uh, there's no, um, yeah, there's a stair, and that person cannot enter. Yep. Thank you, Disney. So, looking at it, even in the, this is really happening. You know, persons with disabilities, even in their homes, cannot access their homes. They cannot go out. They cannot go in they need to help they need someone to help them to go in and out of the house because um they are not informed how to properly put up a ramp or you know it's like it is designed that way narrow doorways there's no accessible toilet and it's some it says something especially for the housing projects that we have in the country eh? uh um the facilities that we that we put up are they accessible and of course it's not just it's not it's important that it's not only the per, the house of the person with disability but also the houses of the uh, the person's relatives the friends that's why there's really a need to you know um like promote accessibility um everywhere because if it's only the house of the person with disability, how can that person go to someone's house, to other people's house? And also like party with them, you know, visit them. Yeah. So yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so here a person in white cane is walking and about, about to hit a billboard with the statement vote XYZ. So, is there a barrier here? Someone said yes. What do you think is the barrier here? Hi, Sheila. It's me, Jen. Hi, Jen. <laughs> um, the barrier is that the... Is this a bullet? A sign is in the middle of the side side road sidewalk yeah yeah <laughs> yes yes thank you jen yeah that's right so it's blocking the way then uh, um if it's if block, block the way then the person with visual impairment might you know bump into it and may cause accident those so there's a physical barrier uh, there's also another barrier here can you identify what's the other barrier aside from the physical one I would like to hear from others as well. Sorry uh, if I... Hello, yeah. coming from Disney. Um, yes. Okay, coming from Disney, um, the, the ramp is not appropriate. On, I think this is on the, not on the sideway. This is 
uh, 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 wrong area or mm -hmm. um, not on the sideway, it's in the center of the uh, the walking, uh, I think, yeah, in the center. Yeah. Thanks, Disney. So, uh, yeah, the wrong placement of the signage. And also, if you will, like, it's the, the, the information and the billboard, it's printed. So how can a person with visual impairment see it? Or if not just the information on the billboard, but, you know, um, campaign information themselves are not accessible. Like, for example, the debates, not all of them have sign language interpreters, uh, uh, ads uh, about, you know, um, information, the campaign by uh, Commission on Election, for example, if it's on printed leaflets and ads, then how can it be accessible to persons who are blind or with visual impairment? Next slide, please. Okay. Here is a picture of a person in a wheelchair who's going to ride an accessible bus. But the person in wheelchair is scratching us, uh, like seems look, looks uh, disappointed. What do you think? Why is that person disappointed? Um, what do you think? Is there a barrier here? Yeah, coming from Disney, that the person cannot pass because of uh, because of uh, because of uh, yeah, uh, the, that person in the winter cannot pass because of a uh, barrier. Um, so the bus is accessible. So the bus yep. has a surround. Yes. Okay, coming from Erica. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah. Uh, for a person who uses a wheelchair, um, it's really hard for them, and they uh, there's no shortcut. So I guess um, uh, we should have at least a system for for us public, especially using the public transportation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for the person who can walk, they can just um, jump or take jump over. But for the person who use who is a wheelchair user, it's really hard for for them. Yep. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Disney. And I think also in the chat box, um, there are also people who said yes. Yeah. Uh, Jen, can you read some of them, please? Or were the responses? Yeah. Sure. Um, Leslie said the wall in front of the person. Ryan said, this reminds me of the Edza bus carousel where persons need to climb steep stairs to access the bus. Uh, Rose said, ab absence of ramp. Miss Alona said, yes, there is a barrier. There's no ramp in the sidewalk. There is also no sign that the bus has arrived. They might not hear. I mean, we can't assume that this person in the wheelchair is hearing. Yeah. yeah. And then RJ said, I think that speaks for institutional barriers too. The norms on accessibility has to change. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for all of your answers. So, um, yeah. Uh, we may have accessible buses, but what about the terminals, the bus, the bus carousels? You're right, Ryan, about the ends of car bus carousels. So um, this is the situation in urban areas. What more in the rural areas? It's even worse, right? So both in the land transportation, in, in seaports, and even in airports. But I think the airport are the most like accessible ones. But you know, it should be everywhere. Accessible must be everywhere. And you're right, it's not just about physical accessibility. It's about also the information and communication accessibility. Like for example, if it's the person with visual impairment who will take a bus, then how will that person know that it's already, you know, the bus stop or for example, the visual signals that we have, like um and the audio signals, it will not just help persons with disabilities. It can be, it also help other people like 
tourists, people who are, you know, unfamiliar with, you know, uh, the place and everything. So, um, somehow it benefits other people as well. Next slide, please. And I would like, just would like to acknowledge also someone who said that, yes, we have a law about accessibility, but it's not being implemented properly. And unfortunately, uh, the government is like one of the prime violators of that accessibility law. So next slide. So a person going to a toilet, but the person cannot enter. Is there a barrier here? What do you think? <clears throat> okay, come from Disney. Yes, Disney. Okay, the toilet is not that accessible because mm -hmm. uh, there's no uh, any hand free. Yep. And um, and for that person to sit, it's really hard for them and it's difficult uh, to yeah uh, they space they spacing the area is not uh, not enough for that person yep <clears throat> thank you Disney so due to the interest of time I'll just go to the answer yes definitely uh yes I believe miss Alo miss Alona said that some door toilets are they are locked and need need a person or someone to unlock it yeah correct so um yes and this uh the access accessible uh we always like um some people take for granted the toilets the uh according to like anecdotes and studies that many children learners with disabilities drop out from school why because they cannot access the toilet so if they cannot access the uh, the toilet, they had to they had to wait. They had to wait that they are able that are they are already home or they even pee or poop in their in their in the classroom because they cannot access the toilet. They cannot go to the toilet. And 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 for women and girls who are having their menstruation, how can they change their pads if the toilets that are not accessible for them? So um yeah. So these are the and also during in, in, in evacuation centers, aside from not having a segregated toilet for 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 people, um they would, uh, these toilets are also not accessible. So like it's like um, the privacy of the person, the safety of the person is being compromised. So next slide, please. So in this uh, slide, you will see that the interaction with, between the personal factors, the impairment, the age, the gender identity, uh, the educational status and other personal factors of a person if it interacts with the environment factors. The environment factors could be the availability or not availability of services, the laws that are in place or not in place, or the attitude of people. If they interact, then it will result to what kind of participation the person will have. Will it be an, a negative on the left side or a negative or like no participation or less participation or it will it be on the right side which is going to the full participation of course if there are more barriers then there will be less participation next slide please so discrimination on the basis of disability it's from the you see our convention on the rights of persons with disability. So basically, it only it says here that any this uh, discrimination at in any area of life, whether it's social, cultural, political, or civil, it's discrimination. Uh, if you treat that person unfairly because of that person's disability, then it's discrimination on the basis of with, on the basis of disability as well as denial of reasonable accommodation, meaning denying the person the support that person need in order to access a service, participate in your meetings, or um, be, uh, be in, uh, you know, 
uh, decide for themselves, then that is discrimination. It can be direct, outright discriminating or indirect. You say, oh, everyone, education for all, healthcare for all, but you do not, you do not uh, comply with accessibility. You do not provide support services. That's indirect discrimination. And even discrimination by association. I, do not, I will not accept this uh, uh, woman uh, 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 in the company because uh, she has a child with disability and having a child with disability means she will not be productive. It, yeah, so that's discrimination by association. Next slide, please. So we're going towards inclusion. So here are three circles representing exclusion, integration, and inclusion. So Again, let me bring you to the context of education. So exclusion, there's a big circle. Inside the big circle are cir small circles in gray. And there are small multicolored circles outside representing persons with disabilities being excluded. Say there are, for example, laws preventing persons with disabilities from voting, from marrying, entering contracts telling them not to study, yeah? So that's outright exclusion. Next one is integration. Um, there's a big circle. Inside it are gray circle. The persons with disabilities are already are now inside the big circle. However, they're still inside a, their separate bubble. So it's like segregating for them special schools for children with disabilities, institutional facilities for those with psychosocial impairments. Those are kind of integration. They are already in the community, but still they are being locked up or they are separated from others. Next slide is inclusion. So that's what we want. People and with and without disabilities grow and develop alongside each other, participating both in family and community life and, you know, um, contributing to nation building. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll show you a video about um, accessibility and universal design to help us uh, like visualize or imagine what can be accessibility or inclusion on the context of you know traveling and enjoying everyday life so let's meet the normals jen will show us a video of it thank you meet the normals adventures in universal design exterior of a house on a sunny day the normals are outside Meet Harry Normal. Harry is the father of the family. He is a stay-at-home dad. Meet Mary Normal. Mary is the mother of the family. She is a manager in the local supermarket. Meet PJ Normal. PJ is the baby of the family. Meet Betty Normal. Betty is the granny of the Normal family. She has arthritis and has lately experienced mild hearing and vision loss, but she is very active and uses a cane to get around. She loves to play the Wii regularly with her grandkids. Meet Susie Normal. Susie is 18 years old. She is going to college. She is rarely seen without her iPod and guitar. Meet Johnny Normal. Johnny is 10 years old, uses a wheelchair, and loves history and music. Family enter the house. Today will be a treat, as Betty is bringing the family for a pizza. First, we need to get the bus, so let's check the bus times. Parents are using the family PC. Oh dear. This seems to be very complicated. Susie uses her smartphone with simple layout instead. Now we've got it. Let's go. For many of us, we never think twice about how we use technology, travel, move in and out of buildings, or use the web. But really, when you think about it, we all often encounter problems doing these things. Family at bus stop. And accept this as a part of life. Consider what it is like for the normals getting on the bus and their experiences. Firstly, let's look at the bus shelter location. Are things in the way? 
Is the bus shelter big enough? Simple things like seating. Access to information when you need it in a way that makes sense. There are other environmental factors, such as light, noise and so on. Bus arrives. And the design of the bus itself. Betty and Susie get on. Dad tries to get baby's buggy up step onto bus but fails. Bus driver asks for fare. Flustered mum drops her purse. Bus departs, leaving Betty, PJ and Johnny behind. A design studio in a different part of town. Thanks to good universal design, it doesn't have to be like this. In order to build a working shelter that suits the needs of everyone, we need the right team. So, let's meet the team. First off, I'd like you to meet Siobhan. She is a software developer. Dara, our civil engineer. Rory is our architect. And Paul, our industrial designer. Normals and designers around a table. Creating the easy to use, universally designed bus shelter is a collaborative and fun process. Right guys? All wave. Let's see how you do it. Firstly, we have the discover phase, where all the designers keep an open mind, deferring any decision making until they have considered a range of alternatives and approaches to the design. They need to have collected as much information as feasible, including new or existing feedback from people. They need to look at the project from the perspective of the end users. So who are the end users and what do they need? Well, a great way to find out is to involve the end user in the process through things such as focus groups where we ask them what they think. Then we have the definition phase, where the designers must decide what they want the design to do. To help achieve this, they must keep in mind the range of people that will be using the design, outputs from the discover phase, and consider what they want the design to do. Then we have the development phase, where the designers look at actualizing the needs they have identified in the previous stage. This stage typically includes the development of simple preliminary designs and asking people what they think. Lastly, we have the delivery phase, where the designers see if it all works. They may get experts to look at their final designs. Another great way to test the design is through user testing of prototypes, where we test early versions of our products on users with a diverse range of abilities to see what works. If something doesn't work, the designers can go back to an earlier phase and try again. The universal design process, with the four phases. Discover, define, develop, deliver. Now we have applied the universal design process to designing the bus shelter, Let's go back and see what happens this time. Family approach new bus shelter. Dad with PJ in a buggy and Johnny in a wheelchair now have an unobstructed path to the bus shelter. Bus shelter is tall enough to accommodate Mary's tall stature. Seating is low enough to accommodate Granny. Bus timetable and fare information is simple and understandable. Starts to rain, bus shelter is large enough to shelter the entire family. Bus arrives. Bus kneels, allowing level entry access to all the family. Thanks to universal design, the normals can go about their day in a world that accommodates us all. Mum has fair ready and pace without any fuss. Family waves and bus pulls away. Universal design is the design of a building or place, product, service or technology so they can be accessed, understood and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability or disability. Created by the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design at the National Disability Authority, in partnership with Dublin Institute of Technology, yeah. NU Imanuth, Cork IT, Dundalk IT, National Thank Learning you. Network, University of Cambridge, Institute of Technology. Yes, thank you, Jen, for sharing it. So, so we saw in that video how we can create uh, uh, an environment that is um, accessible and uh, can be used by everybody, you know, like older persons, persons of different statures, persons have uh, children carrying uh, baggages and. Uh, uh, of course, persons with disabilities. So universal design is a different 
a concept from accessibility. Uh, it can be like I can explain it maybe some uh, some other time. But then the the point here is um, we are able to we have equal opportunities to use a facility to have to receive and impart information on an equal basis with other people. And also if the uh, in that video, it was highlighted that there should be participation by the end user. So next slide, please. So yeah, again, accessibility of physical environment, information and communication, assistive devices and technology, like the, the, the wheelchair of, um, of one of the characters and also the device, the smartphone having uh, like a screen reader the talking software that we people with visual impairment use no? that's an assistive technology and support services like what we have here in this uh in this session the closed captioners and the sign language interpreters so next slide please so here the slide is disability inclusive development so uh, we say that in development, everyone should benefit and everyone should contribute, can and should contribute, and can and should benefit, right? So we have like four pillars of uh, disability inclusive development. So if one pillar is missing, then the, the development won't be as resilient or as sturdy, like if, it, if it's complete. So the first pillar that we should be like um be uh, remember that we should be remembering and applying in our own work uh is awareness so there what we, we are currently doing now is raising awareness about persons persons with disabilities talking about rights what are the barriers that we face how how we can support and include persons with disabilities and one time session is not enough of course it should be regular it should be sustained and the one and persons with disability should be the one talking about their stories their narrative it shouldn't um a person with disability the story of a person with disability or experience shouldn't be told by a person without disability or a, a woman with disability her story is her story shouldn't be it shouldn't be told by uh, a person who has who doesn't have the live experience. So awareness, and of course, in awareness, we also talk about data. So we have gender disaggregated, age disaggregated. How about disability disaggregated? Are we conscious in our organization to collect disability-related data? So if you remember in our registration, we have there a short set of questions, the Washington short set of questions, and we ask you, we ask you of six questions, if you remember that. We, but we did not mention about your, we did not ask you directly what is your disability. So that short set of questions can help you uh, gather data about uh, a person's disabilities without asking them what is your disability because there's still a big stigma about disability and some people don't even know that they have disability so if you can in, you want to include them in your in your uh, registration forms and data collection you may use, use that washington group short set of questions but of course, there are other other tools on data collection on persons with disabilities. Just that is just the most simple and understandable one. <clears throat> Next is um, participation. Of course, if their participation is not just about being meeting, uh, participating in a meeting, eating, listening, and then going home. Participation means being part of the decision making whether it's in on the family whether it's in community life in the organization persons, persons with disabilities are not just beneficiaries they are partners we are leaders we can be the organizers as well so equal participation and next is of course empowerment empowerment we do not empower other people we just support or facilitate the process only the people themselves can empower themselves. So meaning empowerment, decide for themselves, manage their own lives, assert their rights, organize. 
like what we do in novel, or we organize ourselves and we assert our rights. That's empowerment. And of course, accessibility. This not they can the people will not be able to participate, be empowered, and raise awareness if the, their accessibility needs or requirements are not provided. If the meeting venue is not accessible, the information and the communication channels that we have when we conduct our meetings and community activities are not accessible, then uh, participation, empowerment, and awareness will not happen. So these are the four pillars of disability inclusive development. Maybe in future activities, we'll dive in more on these things. So for my last, last slide for about disability, so we talk about twin track approach. So here there are people playing, two children playing the seesaw. So the twin track approach to disability is that mainstreaming disability, thinking disability is a cross-cutting issue in budget, in um, ensuring accessibility, data collection. On the other hand, ensuring also disability-specific requirements like assistive devices, support services like the sign language interpreter and captioner. So if one is missing, then it wouldn't be uh, like, you know, like playing a seesaw. You won't enjoy playing it if you don't have a, a partner. So uh, playing it with you. So that's how we, how we deal about disability as uh, in inclusion. Okay. There is an interesting question that Ryan has posted on the chat. You might want to answer Sheila or maybe later. Uh, it's up to you. But yeah, um, we're um, taking the, the virtual floor back to you. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. So yeah, since that's a burning question, <laughs> I'll answer it right away. So yeah, we do not use and we do not promote the use of PWD or the acronym because it does not uh, reflect the rights based and inclusive language of a uh, person first. So first, we want really to emphasize uh, the word person, that we are a we're a person for so long. We've been fighting to be recognized, to be, you know, to like, to be to be recognized as people with equal rights and with equal dignity so like uh, as other people so if we shortened it, it's like like tri we feel it's like trivializing the the movement the fight and the personhood of the persons with disabilities well you might hear other people even persons with disabilities even P leaders with disabilities who will say PWD uh, in their in their talks in how in their writings even the government but uh, it's not really uh, what we promote. I mean, for us, well, for novel at least, and for other groups who believe in this, who believe in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, like shortening the the person with the disability is um you know like uh, also shortening you know the the you know your 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 view of persons with uh, disabilities so for we yeah that's what we prefer persons with disabilities um and in filipino like when you say pwd like what does it mean? It it can it will create confusion for people. What does it mean? Is it, is it puede? <laughs> like yeah, right. The, the short end for puede is like PWD. So, and if you talk to other people as well, not just in the country but also in abroad, what's PWD? So person first language. Um, that's what we promote. So I hope we'll also start to use that. Uh, not just in speaking, but also in writing. Okay, so I hope that answers uh, the question of everyone, uh, those who asked for, ask that question. So thank you <clears throat> also for clarifying with us. Okay, next, um, next uh, slide. Or Jen, can you please share the slide? Sure, hold on. Okay. 
but of course there's a dis- there's a disclaimer on the like, we will respect whatever the preference of the person if the person prefers to call uh uh the him herself themselves pwd then we'll respect that but as a group as a collective collective it's persons with disabilities yeah so next slide so we're talk- we're here on the this part sex and gender concepts i know many of us are uh, familiar with this and yeah, even more expert than me to talk about this but let me just share to you some uh, so we can relate this to the intersectionality of disability later on okay so we'll have a short activity so in front of you is the gender unicorn very colorful and happy yeah so i'll ask some question and you'll just uh just um try provide your answer in the chat or speak up or speak out on your microphone what it is just to recap what we have discussed last time because some of the participants may not be present here last time okay next slide please so these are the biological differences that distinguish individuals biological physiological differences that distinguish individuals what do you think it is by the way i got this from the most of it i got it from mam nati mam nati mam natis uh, presentation last time so some say sex assigned at birth are there any Sex characteristics from Jen. Angel said sex characteristics, correct. The sex assigned at birth, yeah. So these are the sex characteristics. And this includes the things about chromosomes, hormones, and of course, uh, the external genitalia that we have. And you're right. Um people are being assigned their sex at birth. So people are assigned either female or male. And um, of course, we have people, uh, people who, are, uh, who are identified as intersex. And well, um, there's a growing movement about it. And I think in the Philippines, I don't know how, pro, how, um, uh how do how are we how does the government or the community is acceptable of persons who are intersex but definitely we have um uh people who have that sex characteristics that we should recognize and respect <clears throat> okay next slide please okay so this is the um reflects a deeply felt and experience of one's self's gender who we are of what we think of ourselves so what is that someone said uh, jeff i think jeff gender identity yep ruby said gender identity jen is also an- answering jen you are banned from answering <laughs> <Then joke lang. laughs> just kidding <laughs> So Jen is doing multitasking, answering while uh, showing the slides, tech, providing tech support. Thank you. So that's gender identity, correct? So how do who uh, how do you identify yourself? Whom? Um, of course, um, there are different gender identities. Um, some gender uh, some uh, gender identities are aligned to what's their to their sex assigned at birth so uh, female assigned sex at birth uh, identified as a woman and same as a male assigned as um as uh, identified as as a man and they, they call it cisgender um also there are people who are who have uh, uh, whose uh, gender identity is not aligned with their sex sign at birth and they, they call identify as uh, transgender people 
trans man and uh, trans woman. So there are other gender identities that uh, I won't uh, be able to mention off, but again, uh, it's not just it's not a binary that, that's just a man or a woman or like a cisgender or transgender. It's a lot of things. Next slide, please. So next is, um, this is not from Mam Nati's uh, presentation, but I got it from the, I got it from the net. Um, for, forgive me if it's not the right the, uh, definition, but it's how people manifest or present themselves to the world, their gender identity. So there are people already answering gender expression, so I won't make it long. So yeah, correct, gender expression. So it can be seen, uh, for example, towards our clothing, our how we, we speak, our body language, even the pronouns that we use, uh, our interests. So again, there's no uh, definite or one specific gender expression. Everyone can be can express whatever they want, and on, I mean, feminine, masculine, or neither or either of these things. Yeah. So these are gender expressions. And lastly, last question refers to the person's physical, sexual, or romantic. Uh, attraction to other people okay so some people are already answering sexual orientation correct may tama ka bigyan ng jacket <laughs> so um again uh, people have different sexual orientation some people are attracted the same to people of the same uh, sex or same gender identity some are uh, some are attracted to the opposite sex or other sex. Some are attracted regardless to people, regardless of their gender, sexual, gender identity, sexual orientation. So that's, um, and some people have little or no uh, uh, attraction to, to anybody else. So, yeah. So it's really like a different, different orientations. So next slide, please. Thank you for your participation. So this uh, part, I'll end it with the with the gender unicorn. Uh, uh, how do you call it? Diagram. See, uh, and of course, representing that um, we have uh, different, diverse sex characteristics, gender identity, expression, and sexual orientation. And we can use the gender unicorn to reflect on that. So. Yeah, you can find it online, and if you if if uh, those of you have haven't like uh, use uh, use it or reflect on it, yeah, you may download it online. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So we uh, focus again on gender. So gender refers to the economic, social, political, or cultural attributes and opportunities um associated by being men and women so um it's the society's uh, perception uh, of uh what's the attributes or what are the available or, or not available opportunities to men and women so and um to people it, it it differs from culture to culture from society to society the perception of gender may be different from the philippines compared to the to the to america to europe or to africa to the middle eastern countries Right? Even in the urban and rural setting, there are differences on how people uh, view gender. And even in the different time periods, there is a difference on how um, men and women or people of um, uh, diverse OGS are regarded. Right? They say that in pre-Hispanic uh, uh, colonization, women are... are you know, have um, stronger position or uh, equal opportunities in terms of leadership uh, with men in the Philippines. So, yeah, according to the studies and um, of our uh, 
and uh, of our fellows and colleagues in this in the movement so next slide please so in uh, talk about gender um, there is a highlight on the gender roles it is how we are expected to act speak groom dress and conduct ourselves based on our assigned sex so it's like um the society uh, um put us on uh, this roles no? <laughs> as if we are like actors that you know you should play this role only you should play this role and you should not uh, uh, go outside the role you are playing so like for example uh, uh, the way we conduct ourselves no women are are expected their expectations women are expected to be prim and proper Women are expected to do the domestic work, take care of the family, bear children, and um, with their interests to be like limited in, for example, dressmaking or dancing or like that. And even for for men, you know, there are expectations that men should be like the one in sports. Uh, they like sports or they will be... Uh, tough all time all the time they will be aggressive all the time they are the ones who should earn money for the family and uh, like they should play with toy soldiers and guns and like that so we are put inside those boxes and even in even the um or or people who are who identified in the lgbt QIA plus community. Um, I think they're being like put into roles. Like for example, I have friends who identify themselves as gay. Like people will ask them, who is the woman, who plays the woman in your relationship or who plays a man in your relationship? And like they are disappointed. Like uh, do we do you do people really need to ask that and what's expected like if you're if you are uh, a gay gay person or identified as some a gay then you know people expect this kind of behavior from you or you have different gender identity this will be identified this will be expected of you so those are the gender roles and of course um uh, for example in 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 terms of employment right so um men are expected to be in those stem science technology engineering mathematics and women like they are expected to be on those um, social sciences humanities or in service ser uh, service oriented uh, um uh, jobs no so it's still like they are even outside outside the home the gender roles the tradition the roles assigned to them are carried out in their in how they earn income and like in this in this pandemic you will see that you know a lot of service oriented uh, jobs were uh uh were gone or they are the business is down in the service oriented uh, oriented um, oriented um, businesses and because many women are part of this uh, more women are part of this businesses then uh, the effect is many women are you know lost their jobs and uh, lost uh, lost sources of income so well gender roles um uh depends on the on the person you, you know if you if it's really your interest to to play sport uh, to be in sports to do dressmaking to you know wear dresses and or wear makeup or do not wear makeup at all or whatever it's really up to you it's uh it's your decision but then if you are limited in these roles in it limits your decision it limits your opportunities it limits how you 
um, explore the world and, you know, be yourself, then that's the problem. So, um, and of course, those gender roles leads to gender bias. Next slide, please. So we have here different types of gender bias that happen in our everyday lives on a daily basis, on a micro and macro basis. So stereotyping. So like what I have told you a while back. So it's like overgeneralized, overgeneralized um, view about people on how they should act, how they should be. Um, they should be behaving like, for example, yeah, again, women, no, they should be prim and proper because if they wear clothes that uh, are skimpy or um, wear clothes that are, you know, short skirts, then, you know, they are attracting attracting violence or attracting malice from other people. So, yeah, so stereotyping that men are all tough men do not men do not cry no and that results to men also like being not able to express themselves express their emotions properly and that increases mental health conditions among men yeah and of course for stereotyping for persons with disabilities if you're a person with disability then you will find that you know the the assumption or of people that persons with disabilities are, are unable to manage their own lives or, you know, women with disabilities cannot be in relationship, in marriage life, and cannot be raise a family. That's happening. Uh, medical professional telling women or uh, couples with disabilities that you should not have children because you're incapable of raising them. Or like me, uh, for example, women with disabilities telling people, telling people them, uh, pe people telling them, oh my God, I'm <laughs> tongue twisting already. <laughs> people telling them, oh, um, uh, it's unfortunate, uh, you're so beautiful, but it's unfortunate that you have disability. So those things, uh, like, uh, for some, it seems like a uh, like a unharmful remark, but it's really something degrading to to many of us. Next is marginalization. Of course, um, we do experience that women, uh, people uh, the, from the LGBT community experience marginalization because um, you know the the programs and services uh, the policies that we have especially in the government are not designed to um a first we are not many many times we are not consulted next is that we do we the differing needs of uh, people capacities and needs of people are not taken in consideration so that's why we are being marginalized uh, put in the peripheries when it comes to the policies programs and um, services next is subordination well going back to the marginalization we are seen as invisible like, like for example uh, persons with uh, disabilities as well no we are seen as invisible in the programs policies uh, uh, they will just thought, think of us as they will think of us but they will think of us only as passive beneficiaries not as partners in community building so subordination so this happens in so for, for example in the family you know um, because of that um, like traditional uh, of the role given to men that you know, they should be like the one deciding for the family they should be the one having the last say or they have the authority and so the women and the children are not given uh uh proper st in the space to decide as well to be part of to have a, a say in the table in the family in the organization in the company in the in the uh uh in the public life like what's our data of uh, how many women or lgbtqia plus people are in the in the have leadership or uh, leadership 
uh, positions in our country, in our community. This is also true with persons with disabilities. So, persons with disabilities, kami nang bahala sa'yo, okay na yan, wag mo nang isipin yan. Or in English, I will take care of it. You don't need to to take part in this decision making. We'll uh, um, we'll do it for you. No, so no there, there's no decision, and and uh, especially for those who have intellectual and psychosocial disabilities. Even though they have already reached the adult uh, adult age, they are not yet. Um, instead of supporting them to decide from themselves. Uh, even families are being like overprotective or, you know, thinking of them, still thinking of them as children who will just follow whatever they say. So it really happens in the, in the family and also in the community. And of course, multiple burden. So women um, having, you know, carrying all the, the work, all the work, uh, uh, Like, for example, in this uh, pandemic, um, last year, we have a learning session with different partners in one of our projects with Save the Children. And we have a lot of participants of mothers, um, of uh, children with disabilities. Most of them are mothers. And you can see in that they are, <coughs> excuse me, they are, <coughs> excuse me, they are there participating in the, in the learning session to learn and um, for their organization as well. But also they are still the one doing, taking care of the children. So, and they cannot focus. And, you know, whenever we have like afternoon session, there's always a request that, oh, well, please uh, end the session early because we need to um, cook rice and cook food for the family. So, What happened to the other members of the family? Everything is like everything they rely on to the mother and the mother cannot, you know, focus on what they are doing because they have a lot of things that, you know, uh, uh, doing in, uh, inside the family. And they even teach their children because the, especially the, the, uh, we are, the education is, uh, you know, it's not yet face to face. And of course, violence and abuse. Well, so it happens in different forms. It can be physical, sexual, verbal, emotional, economic, psychosocial abuse to, to women and uh, to, to everybody else. No? Even the hate crimes uh, against uh, uh, transgender women or uh, the LGBT community, it really happens. And of course, for persons with disabilities, you know, uh, the way... Uh, I said last time, I, a while back, that um, abuse, it has persons with disabilities experience uh, greater, um, greater risk. They are greater uh, at greater risk of abuse because of the, uh, because of the perception that persons with disabilities cannot report. We are perceived as weak. We are perceived as someone who cannot testify at the court. So it's there's really a study that deaf women are, you know, have um, a risk of greater violence because uh, the, the perpetrator thinks, oh, the, the, uh, there are no sign language interpreters. They, they, they would not understand them. They would be able to testify well uh, at the court. So they will abuse, rape. A deaf woman, and that's really happening. It's a reality, and even those perpetrators, some of the perpetrators of violence, <coughs> excuse me, against us, get our assistive devices, um, deprive us of our, for example, um, uh, what is this? Um, our medicines or our assistive devices. Yeah, so that, that happens to women with disabilities. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. So just to take a break as well, I'll show you a quick video to see. Um, do persons with disabilities are also, you know, 
in have their own sexuality. So Jen will show us a video about it. Jen, please. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought I yeah. was on the screen. Kindly play the video. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. So I'll see you at seven. Hey, Alex. Was that about Young Inventors Club? Tonight I'm unveiling my latest creation, the pizza taco. It's going to be incredible. Oh, sorry. I was going to tell you. I can't make it tonight. I'm actually going mini-golfing with Jillian Peters. Jillian Peters? Student body president? First chair clarinet and stage band? Fifth level warlock on our ongoing medieval role-playing campaign? She is so cool! I didn't even know you were into that. Medieval role-playing games? No, like, you know, dating. I mean, I hope it's okay to ask, but can your parts do stuff? Actually, my parts work just fine. Just because I'm in a wheelchair, it doesn't mean I don't have crushes or feel attracted to people. In fact, no matter what our bodies can or can't do physically, people with disabilities have the same sexual and romantic feelings as anyone else. And, like anyone else, people with disabilities have various sexual orientations and gender identities too. From heterosexual to gay, cisgender to trans, across a full spectrum of sexuality. But are relationships more difficult for people with disabilities? Well, regardless of my physical ability, I want the same things from a healthy relationship as everyone. Respect, communication, consent, and fun. And, like everyone, I sometimes have questions about relationships. Like, how do I know if someone's interested in me? How do I ask someone out? Or, how do I turn someone down if I'm not interested? Putting yourself out there and trying to date can make anyone feel nervous or scared. But the more you educate and understand yourself and your own value, the better you'll get at feeling confident and making healthy decisions. There are certain issues that people with disabilities could be more likely to face. Sometimes it can feel like parents are overprotective when it comes to dating. Or friends might not think of us in a romantic way because they don't understand that we have the same kinds of feelings. And there are some specific challenges that a person with disabilities might have to deal with. For example, if you had trouble communicating verbally, you'd have to find ways other than speech to express yourself or give consent like using body language, adaptive devices, or pictures. Think of it this way. Everyone's body is different and needs help from time to time. And regardless of a person's physical ability, they can have the same feelings, hopes, and dreams as anyone. Thanks, guys. I think I get it now. Sorry I didn't understand before, Alex. It's okay. And you know what? I've got something that's going to make your date with Jillian even more awesome. One New York-style soft-shell pepperoni and one hard-shell deep-dish bean blaster. Thanks, but were those in your pockets? Just since this morning. Ew. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. <clears throat> okay. So, yeah. I hope um, kind of informs you as well that, you know, persons with disabilities leave love and have relationship like everybody else. You also flirt and, you know, get hurt and, yeah, have hope, dreams, and aspirations, same as yours. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's now go to the next part, the last part of the gender uh, section, which is equity, equality, and empowerment. So the triple E. <laughs> so here we talk about gender e equity. It's a process of distribution of resources and benefits that takes into consideration the different needs of different groups. So <clears throat> looking at it that all people, regardless of our um, SOGS, that we are we have different our needs, requirements, capabilities, and um, this should be taken into account when we, if when uh, we, there is a we formulate policies, we do programs and services, and we do projects as well in the community. Like in this picture, you, know, you when you come to look at it, um, these are people with different heights, and they are given different uh, uh, like steps or stoops. 
uh, how do you say it in English? <laughs> so it's and it's like responding to their different need, differing needs, and with that they're all able to reach the the fruit of the tree. Then they will they are able to achieve equality. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And of course, uh, the, if equity is the means, then the end goal is gender equality that will not just enjoy that regardless of our gender, will enjoy not only equal opportunities and access, but also the benefits and rewards of uh, those opportunities. So for example, um, uh, opportunity, equal opportunity to uh, to be educated, to receive quality education. So <clears throat> it's not just like, oh, you have access to education already, but are we all learning? Are, are we all participating in the school activities? You know, uh, are the textbooks that we have do not perpetuate gender bias against uh, any gender or... Um, are the policies of the school inclusive? Is gender-based bullying being addressed in the in the school, right? Or pers are persons with disabilities able to read, learn, and um, play alongside their peers without disabilities? So, do we have that equality of outcome? And lastly, empowerment of women and people of diverse OGS. So, um. It's really critical because we know that we have that is we have been disadvantaged for so long. So it's important that there's uh, we sh there are measures that would ensure the empowerment of women and uh, um, I know that of course all of us us has the have uh, so GS right. So especially, uh, it's not different from the LGBTQIA community, but yeah, highlighting the LGBT community and women's empowerment. So it's really important that we decide for ourselves and we address the, the, power, the power imbalance between, uh, between genders, between men and women. And it's really important that we are also involve men and boys in this conversation. If it's all into us, then how can we address those power dynamics it will it, it's like we're doing it isolating ourselves and we should promote it's not a war of genders war of sexes but we should work in solidarity with one another so you know we will abolish patriarchy and we'll have an equal will be everyone will be on equal um equal footing or be able to participate equally in the community. But of course, to address those, there should be uh, targeted measures, specific measures uh, for women and girls and for uh, the LGBTQIA plus community. Like for example, passing laws and policies like the SOGI Equality Bill and other the anti-discrimination bill that we have <clears throat> to address those historical discrimination. Okay, so I think, uh, yeah, that's all for the gender part. So before we continue, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Okay. Gina Rose Balanlay is a founding member of and treasurer of the Nationwide Organization of Visually Impaired Empowered Ladies or Novel, a founding member of the Philippine Alliance of Women with Disabilities or PAWID, a member of Philippine Coalition on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and a volunteer peer monitor on Bantay Karapatan ng Mga Kababaihang May Kapansanan, of the Com Commission on Human Rights, CHR, Gender Equality Women's Human Rights Center. She was a member of, a, of Life Haven Center for Indiv Independent Livings, Facilitating Team on Disability Inclusive Development, or DID, Training Partnership with Save the Ch Children. Philippines for their project scope implementation. 
she worked with or as a monitoring and evaluation consultant of the Center for Advocacy, Learning and Livelihood, or CALL, Foundation of the Blind, on its Phase 1 project, uh, founded by the International Foundation, uh, sorry, there is a background noise. Uh, or IFES and supported by General Election Network for Disability and Access or Agenda to promote the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan in the Philippines. So she was a co focal person of women with disabilities in the 2016 Philippine Shadow Report Access to Justice of Marginalized Women in the Philippines by CEDO Working Group Philippines. Um, convener by Women's Legal and Human Rights Bureau, OWLB. She's a 2020 alumna of CREAS India, Disability Sexuality Rights Online Institute, or DSROI, and also a 2019 alumna of the Mobility International USA uh, by International Women's Institute on Leadership and Disability in Eugene, Oregon, USA. So everyone, please welcome Ms. Gina Rose Malanlay from Novel. Ate Jean? I think Ate Gina Rose is having technical problems. Are you there, Ate? Yes, Ate Jean is here, but she's on mute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Though, though I'm here, thanks to ASC for the accommodation I'm here in the hotel, but the the internet connection is still <laughs> sometimes i am um, disconnected so i use uh, my mobile phone to participate so uh, permit me to off my video so that hopefully i can um, discuss my topic without technical barriers so thank you so I hope you are there, and I'm here in my in a summer. So very hard, uh, very challenging is the internet connection here. So can I hear your voices? Can we amplify our voices by using your our uh, sound video feature? Thumbs up. Um, can I see your thumbs up if you are still with me? Okay, uh, how many participants who share or show their thumbs up? Uh, right now I'm seeing a few. Maybe I didn't see it when it was initially up, <laughs> but I can see people giving a thumbs up. Okay, okay so I hope they are still alive and speaking and um, still enjoying the experience with us, the digital. Okay, so let's continue our discussion on intersectionality of disability and gender. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the, the slide says video share video showing intersectionality. 
So it could be start our conversation about intersectionality of disability and gender by showing this video what is intersectionality. So Chen, please do the honor of playing this video. We'll do, hold on. We also have technical. Okay. What is intersectionality? Intersectionality is a way of understanding social relations by examining intersecting forms of discrimination. This means acknowledging that social systems are complicated and that many forms of oppression, like racism, sexism and ageism, might be present and active at the same time in a person's life. Everyday approaches to building equality tend to focus on one type of discrimination, for instance sexism, and then work to address only that specific concern. But while the career of a young, white and able-bodied woman might improve with gender equality protections, an older, black, disabled lesbian may continue to be hampered by racism, ageism, ableism and homophobia in the workplace. Intersectionality is about understanding and addressing all potential roadblocks to an individual or group's well-being. But it's not as simple as just adding up oppressions and addressing each one individually. Racism, sexism and ableism exist on their own. But when combined, they compound and transform the experience of oppression. Intersectionality acknowledges that unique oppressions exist, but is also dedicated to understanding how they change in combination. The roots of intersectionality lie within the black feminist movement, with legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw originating the term. Crenshaw felt that anti-racist and feminist movements were both overlooking the unique challenges faced by black women. She stated that legislation about race is framed to protect black men, and legislation about sexism is understood to protect white women. So simply combining racism and sexism together does not therefore protect black women. Intersectional theory is now applied across a range of social divisions and also to understandings of domination, such as those associated with whiteness, masculinity and heterosexuality. Intersectionality is not only about multiple identities and it's not a simple answer to solving problems around equality and diversity. It is, however, an essential framework as we truly engage with issues around privilege and power and work to bring them into the open. Intersectionality means listening to others, examining our own privileges and asking questions about who may be excluded or adversely affected by our work. As importantly, it means taking measurable action to invite, include and centre the voices and work of marginal... All right, thank you so much. Hello, okay, thank you so much. So the key message of the video is that um, it's not only acknowledging that we have layers of identity that make us more vulnerable and marginalized. People may say, so what if you have multiple identities? So what if you are if you are blind? So what if you are a woman? So what if you belong to an ethnic group? So that studying intersectionality means that going deeply, taking measurable action, um, including investing resources to ensure that everyone is included and then fully participate in society so that um, no one will be left behind as SDG principles to say. So we can we also hear in the video about the word ableism. It means that discrimination in favor of persons without disability. Okay, so next slide please. Jen, next slide, please. Here's Thank you. 
Hello. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes. Thank you. So, um, intersectionality of disability and gender can be understood in terms of prevalence of disability among women and girls who have disabilities and the impact of multiple discrimination. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's have an activity. Let's have a full activity. So, um, Jen, can you please share the question? Yes, uh, I already launched the poll. Um, the other question, the updated one. The updated one on the poll. Yes. No. Actually, I, I, I sent the updated uh, poll question together with the PowerPoint. Yes, I launched the poll already. And people uh, are answering already. Okay, okay. So, so what is the prevalence of disability among women and girls with disabilities? Is it 12%, 15%, 19%, or 24%? A lot of people and, answered. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes, please go ahead. A lot of people answered 24%. 24%. So meaning um, we meant for, for majority of participants answered 24%. Uh, and for the second question, what is the prevalence disability among men and boys? A lot, of, a, a lot okay. of people answered 12%. 12%. Okay, so let's close our question and let's go back to our um, PowerPoint presentation. So, is 24% correct? Is 12% correct? Okay, so according to to the world, um, disability world um, population. What do you think is correct? 20% is correct? Or 12% um, is correct? Or 19%? So, what do you think is the correct answer? Oh, sorry, Ate Jane, I, I showed the slide already. Okay. Um, Hello? Hello? Yes. Um, okay, it's, it's all right. Um, we, can, we can also um, provide. Hello? Anyway, I'm just checking if you're there because I think the signal is not okay here. Okay, so the, the result is 24%. How about if we cross 24%? So what do you think are the, um, based on the choices, what do you think is the, the, the prevalence aside from the 24%? Anyone? Okay. So um, for those who responded the 24%, thank you so much. But it's no worry, we are here to learn. We learn and unlearn. The result uh, is fine. This is just a poll uh, question, a survey. The result, um, the correct answer is 19%. Okay. Thank you so much for those who respond, the 19%. And for the 
Next question, learn the disability. Do you have word processor to show us? Hello? Yes, at the Jane. Okay, so do you say word processor to show us? Majority of our participants say word processor. So, next slide, please. Let's reveal. I'm already here at it on the slide. Um, I've seen the poll activity, right? Okay. Thank you so much. So on my screen is on my screen it says um females are more likely than males to um, experience severe and moderate disability. So this is according to um, 2019 National Disability Prevalence Survey. So, but it's okay because the, the poll question is based on the world report. So 19% um, women with disability, across the world and 12% are men with disabilities across the world. So thank you so much for your participation. And we're from, from Global, we are here, our survey. So the result of our survey is on the screen, 50% are women with disabilities and 9% are men with disabilities who experience um, severe and moderate disability. So, why do you think uh, men, uh, sorry, women or females are more likely to experience severe and moderate disability? Anyone can share? Why do you think females, based on the NDPS, at the same time, the world survey, women are more likely to experience disability. So you can open your microphone to share. So anyone can share why do you think more um, females experience severe and moderate disability? Uh, at the gym, there is an answer from Gayatri. Um, they said that they are more prone to violence and childbirth, maybe. Thank you so much. Anyone aside from being prone to violence. It's correct. So aside from that, Sheila mentioned about the different barriers that persons with disabilities experience. And she also shared I think at the gym got disconnected. But I'll answer. So hello. Let's... Hello. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes. Come again, please. We can hear Go ahead, you. Ate. I think Jen is sharing something from the responses of our participants. Yes, there are two more answers from Rose. They said ex um, experience to multiple burden roles 
since young since they were young to marriage life and then tina said early pregnancy reproductive system not yet ready for childbearing and alvin said health and welfare of males are prioritized over their female counterparts in the family especially children very correct thank you so much for your responses so if we combine the barriers faced by persons with disabilities at the same time the gender bias faced by being a woman so we have multiple global discrimination as they say because of being uh, because of being a woman at the same time disability um in terms of the allocation for example allocation of um scarce resources the tendency is they prioritize the needs of men over women the tendency is that women especially those who are pregnant cannot access the programs and services going to the to the hospital for health care or uh, sexual and reproductive health so the tendency is in terms of um, pregnancy the result of the baby so there's an impact a chain reaction multiple discrimination so thank you so much of your responses and we have well go deeply to this what we call multiple discrimination next slide please so we will have an activity naming the impact of multiple discrimination so if what do you think are the specific impacts of multiple discrimination to women and girls with disabilities so in this case they say the pink pink wow it's a delicious um filipino food a native food it is tapping tapping because of the literal meaning layered food so that um the term intersectionality um i this is this is my favorite term when we use intersectionality it means tapping tapping so aside from patong patong sanga sanga so tapping tapping because this is um delicious okay so using annotation tool so please um, share your opinions about these things, the specific um, multiple discriminations that we face, being a woman, being a woman who cannot see, who uses wheelchairs, so, and among others, and other experiments. So annotation tool, so if you open the the view option so there is a annotate from top to bottom you just click annotate and you can type and you can use the pencil icon or you can use it you can click the draw drawing so that you can express your responses using a drawing hello can you hear me Yes, we can hear you. Okay. The co-host has um, asked you. I'm sorry, I cannot um, open my video because of my um, internet connection. So to ensure that I'll not be disconnected anymore. So I'll just stay um, off. So one of the examples that I may share that we can also write in or, or annotate in our screen is about um, gender violence. One of the responses on the activity that we had, the reason why men are vulnerable or men are we are sorry, women are experiencing severe and moderate disability
So, um, are there responses on the screen? None yet. Or is my instruction clear? I'm repeating it in the chat. So we have five minutes for this activity. So one of the examples that you can write or annotate is about gender violence, about health and well-being. So you can also put that in our screen. Uh, sorry, your audio is a bit muffled. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, but it's a bit muffled. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. So we are we only have two minutes for this activity. There are answers. But if you on cannot this... access, sorry, go ahead. Can you... Hello. Hello. Can you please, if just in case there are responses from the chat box, can you please transfer it on our screen? Yes. Yes. Um, but I can read the ones on the screen now. Okay, hello. Okay, I'll I'll just read them. Thank you. Uh, in disaster response, needs are not considered. Women have lower... It was Zero limited access to public services. And then in the chat... Those imposed by different institutions of our society, government, family, law, Etc. in various dimensions of women's lives, economic, mental, political, etc. Thank you so much. Uh, Rose said, women are deprioritized on social, economic, and political opportunities like education. Sorry, my mouse is gone. <laughs> education and but I'll continue I'm sorry Miss Rose I can't read um, Vincent said employment opportunities are less and then education programs are limited just the system is not inclusive correct are there more responses? So we, I guess we only have one minute for limited, this activity. Limited opportunities to go abroad for work. Okay, I can see Ms. Rose's answer now. Um, women are deprioritized on social, economic, and political opportunities like education, business. Therefore, women tend to have low self-esteem.
Thank you so much. Are there more responses? Yes, from Angel. Lesbians are discriminated for being a woman and lesbian, especially in the workplace. In the LGBTQIA plus community, lesbian issues are often neglected. Correct. Uh, someone else said Thank children's you. needs in times of... Uh, what did you mean, uh, Tina? Hello, this is Tina. Can I continue with that phrase? Yes, yes. I, I, yes. My, my first sentence is uh, children's needs in times of humanitarian response are not usually prioritized. Yeah, that's the, that's the sentence. Uh, that's the phrase. Prioritization. Children, I, right? Children are not prioritized in terms of programs and services, budget allocation. Humanitarian response. Humanitarian response. Okay. Disaster and humanitarian response, including yeah. war, right? Yeah, okay. all kinds of disasters. Correct. Other responses? Um, from Vincent. Thank you so women, much. Last, last response. Women with disabilities are seen as inferior in terms of reproduction. Correct. So we are being perceived, perceived as being asexual and not capable of raising a family, raising a children. Are there more responses? Pahabol? None. Hello. Okay, thank I'm you there. so much. Hi. Uh, hello, sorry. Uh, coming from Disney. Go ahead. Um, for the deaf and fair person with disability and LGBTQI for workplace, for example, uh, they are accepting persons with disabilities for the job, but when they notice that they are also an LGBTQIA, uh, they are no longer fit for that job. Coming from this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, correct. So uh, some would say, sorry, we don't accept disabled person. Anyone? So thank you so much for your active participation. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'll just stop sharing for a while because I lost ah, sure. my course or <laughs> I guess there's a response from chat box. No. From RJ. Oh, there. Oh. Sorry, everyone. From RJ. Non access to services that are given to heterosexual couples. Okay. So. Okay, thank you so much. So next slide, please. Here. Let's go on to the next slide. Yes, we're here. I see in my screen. Uh, we're already in the next slide. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, um, here are the impacts of multiple discrimination of women on women and girls with disabilities based on CBM um, narratives from the global south. 
So some of these were already mentioned by our participants. First is the sexual and the reproductive health and rights and right to family life. So um, women and girls with disabilities in many parts of the world, not only in Asia, face a number of barriers to accessing sexual and reproductive health care. And of course, we cannot enjoy the family life that we should enjoy on an equal basis of, uh, with others, right? So um, this includes not only physical barriers, such as lack of access to um, facilities and transportation, which Sheila mentioned a while ago. So we, they also, this also includes uh, the poor, the communication difficulties, and the negative attitude of health workers. So when actually when a person or a woman with disability go to the hospital and for family planning, um, the actual, the initial reaction of healthcare providers is that love and marriage is not for you. You do not have the right to raise a family because you are disabled. So that's a negative attitude. Next is um, gender-based violence. So more women and, and girls with disabilities uh, experience all forms of violence compared to those without disabilities because um, people, perpetrators would perceive that they are weak, they cannot see, they cannot um, go to the police, Access, they cannot access justice. That's why uh, we are prone to violence, harassment. And next is access to education. Some share that um, women and girls with disabilities, more women and girls with disabilities cannot access to education. And the family, if, if uh, the, the um, firstborn child it has disability, and she's a woman, and they have many children. The tendency of the, of the parents would is that they will tell to their to their daughter that you have to give chance to your next to your siblings who do not have disability because you do not you don't need education. Next is livelihood, work, and pay. Um, women with disabilities spend to earn less than men with disabilities. So all of which, um, the impact of women with disabilities, this, this is uh, more vulnerable to risk and to poverty because they do not earn income, they do not have money, so they cannot, they cannot buy for their needs, especially um, the basic needs. So tendency is they can possible to have another uh, disability or another um, form of disability. Next is um, access to assistive devices. Assistive devices, support services, it's very important to us for us to live on an equal basis with others, to participate in community. So there are inequalities between men and women with disabilities in accessing assistive devices. So compared to men, they prioritize men with disabilities because of the thinking that men with disabilities should be more productive than women with disabilities. Next is um, health and well-being. Um, women and girls with disabilities are at greater risk than those without disabilities of, um, you know, of exclusion from screening and um, the, in the diagnosis of health problems, for example, um, breast 
and cervical cancer. So the tendency most women with disabilities are prone to breast cancer and any forms of can other uh, cancers of, because they uh, the the health or the hospital is not accessible and even the facilities. Next is access to water and sanitation. So this is more on um, in the rural area. Um, this is a gendered issue. The responsibilities of for um, household water collection and management, especially in here um, in the province, are basically um, linked to women and girls. Um, domestic roles in the household, like cooking, of course, we need water, when we cook, when we clean, when we do the laundry, when we uh, prepare for food, for the kids, when we um, do some other uh, stuff in our, in our house. So insufficient um, provision and location of facilities like in school to can make women and girls more vulnerable to um, harassment. Next is some shared about the situations of conflict and humanitarian crisis and what um, other forms of disasters. Yes, it's true that in evacuation centers, the backwit women with disabilities in Marawi at the same time, those who were uh, experienced in um, staying in the evacuation center shared how difficult it was, um, it was to live in the evacuation center because it, there were no uh, provision of um, accessible toilets and other um, things. So there is no privacy in evacuation centers. So that's all. Next slide, please. We're on the next slide. Yes, um, sorry, I'm a bit um, fast because of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I oh. guess we're only uh, up to 430 and it's 429. Yeah. So um, question. Is it okay with you if we have another activity? Just so this is another activity. If it or just um, to share your responses, what do you think? Uh, the title of the activity is finding the pathway to uh, equality and inclusion. So what do you think are the ways? to advance women and girls with disabilities. This is also an annotation activity. But because of the time, it's 430, it's okay if we um, extend a few minutes, it give us your thumbs up if it's okay with you if you spend 30 minutes of our time. I know how precious the time is. There are some, there's one person I saw who raised their thumb. Thank you, RJ. Oh, and we also have an answer to your question in the chat box. Rose said, mass okay. education of communities through LGUs and CSO. Correct. So we have to work with uh, PSO, LGU, that's what we call whole of society approach. Because according to the disability justice principles, we should work with that we should not only work with both disabilities, but we also work with both movement and other stakeholders for our collective liberation. Okay, so perhaps I will leave this as our 
as our um, assignment. But the, the response, some of the response is in the next slide. Okay. According to CBM, so the progress towards equality and inclusion for women and girls with disabilities needs to include the basic action. First is the we have to challenge ableist attitude. So meaning to say that we have to eliminate social or attitudinal barriers. We, we define disability. So that's the first thing that we have to do. Attitudinal barrier is the most um, difficult to remove. So in, in the US, um, law, once they have a law, they have to follow it. So, policy first and then attitude. But here, we have policies, yet we still have negative attitudes towards persons, women and girls with disabilities. So we need to, to reframe first, we need to eliminate attitudinal barriers for us to make for, the, for our law, lawmakers, all stakeholders um, make an inclusive law for all persons, including persons and women with disabilities. So we have challenge, uh, evolved attitude, and then we need to end an equal power relations and discrimination. So next is, we have to eradicate violence towards women with disabilities. So there must be a continuous um, or sustainable um, procedure to dismantle highly gendered patriarchal systems that are embedded with our society. So that's a way to eradicate violence towards women and girls with disabilities. And of course, we have to empower women with disabilities as, and to we have also to be recognized agency. So, so once we empower women and girls with disabilities, they know that they have rights, they have influence, they can decide for themselves, and they, they can demand the inclusion of their voice in the design of policy. Next is to address um, the specific needs of women and girls with disabilities. Um, just to ask what, if you remember what Sheila said, what is the, the um, approach that we should um, apply in order for women and girls with disabilities to um, mainstream in society. It, it begins with letter T. It's a twin track approach. So we need to use twin track approach to mainstream disability inclusion, as well as to ensure that people with disabilities are empowered and with their specific needs. So twin track approach. And lastly, a holistic, intersectional, multi-sectoral, and joined up approach, okay? So it means that we need you, we need the government as duty bearers, and of course we need individual, the concerned women and girls with disabilities, so to, um, for the government to do the duties and um, for women and girls, of course, um, as stakeholders, we need everyone to be involved for the inclusion of all, not only, of course, women and girls with disabilities. So next slide, please. The next slide is a video mm -hmm. about gender equality. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, it's already on the screen. Responsible. Okay, thank you so much. So this is the last um, slide. So in our screen, the question is who is responsible? Is it the individual or is it the state? I, am, I mean, individual being a rights holder or the state as duty bearers or our family, community, or at the same time, the private sector. We are all responsible to ensure that um, we conduct a race racing training for all um, members of society to know uh, the rights of women and girls with disabilities, like what we are doing here. We are all responsible in doing research to ensure that the narratives of women and girls with disabilities are taken, documented. We are all responsible as, as um, individuals. We should um, inform so that we should inform the, the government the discriminations that we are facing so that government will take necessary measures being a duty bearer through laws and policies. They should um, make enforce the law or um, make or approve laws and policies that are um, disability and, or disability inclusive, I mean. They should allocate resources which are inclusive for persons with disabilities, including men, children, and those um, youth, other persons with disabilities. And of course, we should um, provide inclusive services and how can it happen? How Through um, active participation of women and girls with disabilities from planning up to evaluation, because if nothing about us without us according to our tagline us in the UNCRPD. So it means that we need you, we need other persons that work hand in hand to ensure that no one will be left behind because disability is a cross-cutting, cross-sectoral issue. So come on, let's do the pathway and the roadmap that the video was um, shared. So that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you for bearing with us up to um, 447. And now I will give the microphone to Hannah, our host. Thank you very much, Ate Jean. Okay, thank you very much, Ate Jean, for that uh, very informative discussion as well. Even I have learned something. So now we are going to the Q and A or question and answer. Question and answer. I have a few questions here on my end, and um, yeah, I hope you're ready. <laughs> First. I'll read the first question for both of you, Sheila and Ate Jean. There are disabilities that are invisible. How can we ensure inclusion of people with non-visible disabilities? So, siguro, like, I think Sheila first. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, indeed, there are in, uh, apparent and non-apparent uh, impairments. And well, um, being inclusive, I think it should, you know, asking, consulting everyone. It's like always consulting everyone. Um, first is that using the Washington short set of questions that I mentioned earlier, the six simple questions that would help you and your participants to identify uh, if there are functional limitations um, uh, in your on your participants and I think um, being inclusive is like you know really thinking of everyone it's not like being being like selective of um, for example describing what's on the what's the visual content 
being uh, um, like uh, thinking of the facing of the of your words, thinking of your thinking of uh, using simple language, using plain language pictures to convey information, um, thinking of accessibility uh, or venue that is accessible to everyone in distance as well as uh, if there's like ramp or elevator. I think it not only benefits persons with disabilities, but it benefits also everyone. Like regardless of your, um, regardless of your uh, like um, background or identity. I think we cannot go wrong, of course, with consulting people. I mean, asking your participants what what are your requirements for this, for example, for the meeting, for this program or this services. Then you will know. You will be able to design with them uh, an inclusive service or an inclusive policy or an inclusive uh, meeting. Yeah, consultation is the key. Yes, I agree. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Ate Jean. Okay, thank you. So you know, um, I strongly agree with Sheila, so I just add on that actually that's in an article um, in CRPD Article 4.3 that we should closely control uh, persons with disabilities in, uh, in matters involving them. So it's uh, very clear. But how can we control persons? Or how can they, they share their narrative if they don't know what is human rights? It's all about what human rights is all about. It's meaning they are not empowered. So it means that we also use the four pillars on disability inclusive development that she uh, shared. The first is awareness raising. So as a, an empowered a person who do not have disability, um, and you know who are those who are invisible and yet they are they lack confidence they cannot participate in society because they have low self-esteem so it's our it's a challenge i challenge you um fellow participants to raise awareness that they too have equal rights inform them that they should need they need to know their rights so that they can also enjoy their rights once they are empowered they can demand the rights they can demand to be in the decision making table so that um, the, the, the activity are uh, appropriate for them. That would be all. Thanks for your answers, Ate Jean and Sheila. I love how um, the answers are also um, in the discussions that we had earlier, like empowering persons with disabilities to know our rights and um, know that um, the duty bearers should demand for it. And so we go to the next question. I think as a founding member or one of the founding members, Ati Jean, you can answer this. What is Novel's agenda for inclusion? Of course, um, we are here not only for our fellow women and girls with visual impairment, but we are here to carry out the issues and concerns of all women with disabilities. That's why we um, link with different stakeholders to, to raise our voices and, of course, we to promote disability inclusive development, which is necessary for the inclusion of with not only persons, but specifically more so, I mean, uh, specific um, women and girls with disabilities because we are, as based on the statistics, we, we are, um, that the numbers show that there are more women with disabilities, and yet we are more invisible and prone to violence. Do you have anything to add, Sheila? Well, what's our agenda for inclusion? Basically, why you came here is also the reason why we came here. We want our voices to be heard. We want to partner with you because we believe we cannot do this alone. It should be a multi-stakeholder approach. 
we should be working together, sharing, learning from each other, and also like working with the government. The government is not our enemy. And yeah, we want to be included not just in the personal level, on the family, home level, but also in public life. And yeah, this is deciding for ourselves and um really participating in uh, uh, all activities and yeah about intersectionality that's uh, why really why we are here thank you Hi. thanks um, can I add? go ahead ate um, as i read the, the emails about of course we this is um, july and we are the Although it's uh, NDPR, but of course we are about awareness raising about disability. And um, July is also a disability pride in the U.S. and disability justice. So one of the, the uh, some of the principles of disability justice, which also um, the agenda of the novel, which we carry, is the, of course intersectionality. At the same time, I, as um, also Shira said, that we are not here for for the partnering with our fellows within the cross uh, with the disability but cross movement and of course that's what we are doing here uh, we partner with the chief to ensure that our voices are being cleared uh, spread the message of inclusion full participation effective participation i mean for women and girls with disabilities across um, not only our country but globally okay thank you for that uh ate jean and um sheila so i think that will be our last question for now for more <laughs> questions that you want answered um i think sheila and ate jean can um leave novels contact information also if you'd like to partner yes. anyone yeah thanks hannah um yeah you can message us uh we're part of the messenger group of fifth uh, you can message us if there are other questions you can email us uh <clears throat> you can email us we'll put our email addresses on the chat and yeah, we also have a Facebook uh, page, uh, Novel Philippines, and Facebook account that's Novel Feels, P H I L S. So, yeah, we can communicate there. And so, if you want to know more about uh, disability, gender, and its intersectionality, and yeah. And thank you, everyone, for your participation in today's learning session. Yes, thank you very much, everyone, for being here until five. <laughs> and uh, yes, Ate, do you have Can anything? Yeah. I just remember, of course, we are here as partners. Yes, we are here as partners. But um, if you um, want to share more about disability in your organization, and we are here now, but it's uh, more than willing to share about disability if you conduct um, again about a webinar or training in your organization but in your specific organization so you would be happy to to share about the digital in your organization yes okay thank you ate jean and sheila